On last episode, we discussed Engine's Tomb and the Hall of Reflection. On this episode, we're going to look at the small rooms that dot about this map, and then we're going to conclude with Kuzaban's Tomb in Area 42. Let's begin. Area 33, Chamber of Opposition. This chamber contains a stone font filled with a steaming green liquid. Beyond it, a shadowy figure stands at an open door on the far side of this room. The figure's back is towards you. So I really enjoy this puzzle. It's really straightforward. As your character arrives here, a shadowy figure will appear directly in front of this door. So as your player characters arrive here, this shadowy figure is a representation of themselves. It has the statistics of a commoner, and whatever your character does, this character here is going to mimic. So let's say it steps backwards, he's going to copy. If your characters walk forward, he's going to do the same. If your character waves, he's going to copy. And if you run away, he's going to disappear, he follows you. Whenever a character opens this door right here, the duplicate is going to copy whoever opened this door. So we have this fun middle of the room. The puzzle is you need to get your characters. We're going to step back so their character stands on the font. If your player character mimics drinking the mystery green liquid in this font, over the course of eight turns, so he will drink five pints of green liquid every turn, when it's completely finished, an incandescent orange crystal appears at the bottom of the font, which can easily be removed. Once it's removed, this non-magical eye crystal can be used as one of the ten keys needed to open the beholder's font. But if only it was that easy, let's say that character A starts a mimic and another player character comes around and he looks at your duplicate's face. As your other characters look at this face, you'll see how terrifying it is. They'll have to make a wisdom saving throw with a DC of 15. If they fail that saving throw, they fall to zero hit points. So when I did this with my players, luckily enough, one at a time they came in, they tried. For instance, we had one person run out the room. We had one person dance in the font. We had one person try to drown themselves in the font. Just to clarify, when your characters come in, as soon as they open this door here, Illusionary Duplicate will appear here. This Illusionary Duplicate will copy whatever this character does. If your character step back, he's going to step into the font. If your character mimics to drink the soup below this mystery green liquid, the liquid will dissipate and it will coalesce into a treasure. If your characters access the crawlway to the north of the reflected halls, they'll come into area 32, the rotating crawlways. So they'll crawl in here, so the crawlway is 3 foot high and 2 foot wide. If they make a DC 15 perception check, they notice that this seam here is the end of a crawlway. If it succeeds by 5 or more, they realise that this room can rotate. When your characters trigger this trap, they'll hear, with a loud grinding noise, this section of crawlway begins to rotate instantly cutting off the exits ahead and behind. You can feel the passage sink about 5 feet as it turns. After a few seconds, it comes to a stop and the grinding abates. So there's two tunnels in this section, so you have tunnel A and tunnel B, and I'll show you in this opposite diagram. So let's say this is your character here, if he crawls inside tunnel A, once he applies 50 pounds of force, or 22 kilograms, this hallway is going to descend. It's going to rotate clockwise 90 degrees, it's going to sink five foot into the ground. So this character is now stuck underground below tunnel B. And if you press 50 pounds again, or for instance, 25 kilograms, it's going to rotate anti-clockwise and it's going to rise five feet. If another player character stands in this crawlway and sees the first character descend, they'll see in area B, a new tunnel rotates into place. You see a skeletal corpse lying on the floor of that tunnel, about 10 feet away. This corpse belongs to Sephiroth, a dragonborn paladin of the Company of the Yellow Banner. If you look at his body, you'll notice that he has a plus one Yanka, he has a holy symbol of Behemut, and this is one of my favourite add-ons to the book. It has no relevance to the story, but I think it's quite funny, a little easter egg. He has an ivory back scratcher shaped like a dinosaur's claw. Pouch of the eight gold pieces. So Sephiroth has one red crystal eyeball, which measures one inch in diameter, and this is one of the keys for the Beholder's Vault. When the players in my game went in this puzzle, first thing they did was they came in, and our cleric walked in, and he sunk to the ground. The next player seen this, and they flew through the tunnel, and realised that the tunnel wouldn't activate. So if you fly use gaseous form, as long as you don't put any pressure in this tunnel, it won't sink or rise. And what they did is they got their backpack and they chucked their backpack into the hallway and this caused the whole room to rise and that's how they freed the cleric. If you think of any other ways that your characters or yourself would do this puzzle, let me know in the comments below. So we have discussed 33 and 32, so now let's go down the hallway, back through the reflected hall and we'll access this room in area 36. 
This is the Chamber of Respite. The main thing about this room is the Tomb Keepers have all but forgotten this tiny room. This is the only room in the whole tomb where your characters can take a long rest without getting interrupted. The way I played this was the first rest was uninterrupted. However, if your characters camp here, let's say they take four or five long rests, Weathers and the Tomb Dwarves are going to find this out. So the way I play it is they can take two or three long rests in this room. However, if they keep on abusing this, it's also the fact that the Death Curse is a constant threat. You don't want to stay too long in the tomb. So this room connects to Area 37. This is the Winds of Pandemonium. When I first read this room, I thought it was quite mundane. However, due to the way I made it and the way my players went through it, it became my favourite room in the entire tomb. We won't discuss this now. We'll discuss this in the next episode. So we're now going to make our way to Kuzaban's tomb. So we're going to walk through Area 41. Area 41, Tomb Guardians. Two hulking figures stand in alcoves along this long hull. Facing each other, armour is bolted to their flesh and they wear bucket helms and spike gauntlets. Iron collars around their necks are connected by a spike chain that stretches across the corridor. You have two flesh golems here. They have heavy armour on, so AC of 17. And these tomb guardians are slightly buffed compared to the other ones that are in the tomb made by Weathers. So they have spike gauntlets, which do extra damage. And yeah, they guard this hallway. So they're both connected by a chain. They're both linked together magically. So their hit point pools are combined. So let's say your cat are standing here. They can make faces, they can jump up and down. These tomb guardians will not attack. They only attack if your character walks through this threshold and walks past the chain. So the total hit points is 93, so if you do 100 points of damage to one of them, they'll both take 50 points of damage. The spike chain can be attacked separately, it has an AC of 18, a damage threshold of 10, and 5 hit points. And because it's an object, it's immune to poison and psychic damage. If the chain is broken, both of these tomb guardians will go berserk. When they are connected to each other by this chain, they can't go any further than 15 feet apart. So if I was playing these and my characters came in, what I'll do is I would get both these Tomb Guardians to attack one player. If you want to change the encounter slightly, so at this point I would expect that your characters have met the Tomb Guardians numerous of times, and Flesh Golems are vulnerable to fire. So one thing I would change is, because these are unique Tomb Guardians, I would change their vulnerability. So let's say we change it to perhaps Cold, maybe Radiant Damage instead of Fire, just so it keeps your characters on their toes, because the first thing they'll do is they'll cast Fireball or a spell that does lots of fire damage. And you think they'll win, but if we change up just a little bit, it just makes the encounter a little bit more interesting. And again, if you've got any thoughts about this, let me know in the comments below. So once your characters defeat the Tomb Guardians Area 41, they can come through and then go straight ahead into Area 43, or they can go north to Kuzaban's Tomb in 42. So let's go with Room 43, Veils of Fear. This room lies beyond Double Door, the outside of which is carved with leering and laughing skulls. The doors are neither locked nor trapped. Ten feet from the doors, a thick tapestry curtain hangs from wall to wall. Its embroidery shows a scene of merriment. Nobles feasting around a banquet table, a roast boar on a platter, and servants pouring wine. So as they go through this tapestry here, you'll see the second one, and this is where the scene gets a bit more deprived. Another curtain hangs behind the first, showing the same scene but descended into depravity. The nobles fight with each other, partake in carnal encounters on the table, or spoil on the floor in puddles of vomit. So yeah, so the images here are getting a bit graphic. So we have people uh, doing birds and bees on the table. You have someone who's drunk too much on the floor. You have people fighting for each other's honour. And this is when we get to the final tapestry where things get really interesting. A scene of horror confronts you. Nobles facing on servants, eating each other alive and setting fire to the hall. The roast boar is alive and laughing on its platter. If your characters cast a tech magic spell, they'll notice that this veil here has an aura of enchantment magic. Once they look at this, any creature that looks at this curtain must succeed in a DC 14 wisdom saving throw or be frightened of it. The frightened creature will run and he cannot re-enter this room. If they go past the final curtain, they'll meet the Lord of the Feast. The rotting head of a giant boar is mounted on the wall, behind the final curtain. Fresh blood and gore splatters its tusks, dribbling down the hall beneath it. If your characters come through, they go through all the curtains and they'll see this boar on the wall. If they make eye contact with this boar and see it, they have to make a DC 16 wisdom saving throw or be charmed by it. And if you're charmed by this boar, you have no choice. Your character is going to walk forward and it's going to stick its head in its gnarly jaws. Every time the jaws crunch on a player character's head, they're going to take 4d10 slashing damage and they'll have to repeat the saving throw. 
If he champs it enough and he gets your characters to zero hit points, they are decapitated. If you succeed the saving throw, you can't be charmed again for 24 hours. So the way that you survive this is very straightforward. And the boar's head, he sucked to walls, so he can't run after you. He has an AC of 5 and he has 22 hit points. So when my characters came in, the first thing they did was they burned down the veils after seeing the images. And our sorcerer seen this boar's head, was charmed, and she started to slowly walk towards its head. In terror, everyone started to attack this boar before she arrived there. If you destroy the boar's head, you notice there's three items within its teeth. You have a bent pair of gold spectacles, you have a leather eye patch with a bloodstone, and you have a platinum hairpin, which is worth 75 gold pieces. So with me personally, I think this room's very graphic and it suits the campaign setting. However, if you do have players or people that are be with you while you play this that are very sensitive, it might be something to change or something just to bring up in conversation before you play because it is quite a scary room and you want to make sure people enjoy the encounter and they're not too terrified of it. However, in my opinion, I think it's fantastic and I thought it was a very, very fun character to play. And it definitely brought out the atmosphere of a scary tomb in the middle of the jungle. Let's go on to Kuzaban's tomb in Area 42. Kuzaban's tomb. A four-columned portico juts out from the far wall, beneath which a stone sophocus rests in a wall recess. Four ceramic frog masks hang in niches around the sophocus. Beneath the mask, humanoid bones are screwed across the floor. To the east, a large carving of a tentacled frog monster squats above a shrine. Offerings lie on a shelf before it. Four rectangular frescoes adorn the adjacent walls. So let's say you arrive to this tomb and your characters are possessed by various trickster spirits. Greedy Nang Nang urges her host to snatch up the gold coins on the wall shrine. Cautious Obalaka warns against trying on the masks. Why Shibagwe is convinced that the frescoes are clues to understanding the power of the wall shrine. So let's look at the room. We have entrances here. Sophocus over here, to the north. To the east, we have the shrine and the table here. And the frescoes are here and here. So how do we unlock Kuzaban's Sophocus then? Well, so the way you open up his Sophocus is that you perform four rituals while wearing frog masks. So what are the clues then? So what's in the frescoes? In the first image, fresco one, we see a frog like behemoth uses its tentacles to help the Omalian people knock down a mighty statue. In the foreground, an old woman wearing a frog mask tosses five coins from her hand as though sowing seeds. The first clue says that you need to donate five gold pieces, or at least five gold pieces to the shrine while wearing a frog mask. The second clue, a frog-like behemoth wraps his tentacles around a giant crocodile, as Omalian hunters stab the crocodile with their spears. In the foreground, an old man wearing a frog mask holds a bug up to his open mouth. So this is a clue for your characters to do the ritual where they have to eat a bug, living or dead, while wearing a frog mask. So we have two so far, so let's see what the remaining two are. Fresco number three, a frog-like behemoth with four million hunters riding on its back, finds a small boy in the jungle. Hunters seem elated. In the foreground, a young woman wearing a frog mask holds a knife in one hand and the hellish chicken in another. So this clue here is one my players had trouble with. So this is a clue for spill the blood of a living creature into a copper bowl while wearing a frog mask. We have a copper bowl containing rat bones. So you need a living creature to cut themselves and bleed into this bowl while wearing the mask. And for the final one, fresco number four, a frog like behemoth wallows in a shallow pool as O'Malians offer it urns of food and treasures tribute. Cracks in the fresco obscure the head of the human figure in the foreground, but you can see that it grafts a lit candle. So the final clue is that you have a green wax candle with savage little wick. So as long as you light this candle while wearing a frog mask, you perform the ritual. If you've done all four of these rituals correctly and you've not made any mistakes, Kuzaban's Hofka is well open. Let's just go over again. You have the four frescoes. Each one contains a clue. You have the wall shrine here. Frescoes here. You have two frescoes here, two here, and this is the wall shrine. We have the statuette, the copper bowl containing rat bones, four dead cockroaches, a green wax candle with a salvageable wick, and five gold pieces that are loose. So if you do that all correctly, you access Kuzaban's tomb. However, if you fail, you summon three wraiths. So from the bones in the floor, three wraiths will appear if these rituals are done wrong. And when they're summoned, if any character is wearing a frog's mask, they'll be polymorphed into a frog. So let's look at wraiths. What can wraiths do? Well, wraiths have low armor class, relatively high hit points. They have a lot of resistances. So they're resistant to acids, cold, fire, lightning, thunder, bludgeoning and piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons. 
that aren't silver. They are immune to necrotic and poison, and they're immune to conditions of a charmed, exhaustion, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, prone, and restrained. They can see in the dark, and they can go through characters. So they can do two things. So they can do life drain, as I mentioned before. It's a very, very dangerous ability because your characters cannot regain hit points during this adventure. And they can create spectres. A spectre is a weaker version of a wraith. That's a life drain ability as well. It has less resistances, but has the same immunities, caution and damage. So if I was playing this for my characters and they trigger this effect, that the characters that are wearing the frog masks are polymorphed. So I'll make sure I do that before I forget. And then I'll get all these wraiths to summon spectres. We'd have six enemies in this tomb instead of three, and then they're all going to attack until they're defeated. So this is potentially very, very dangerous. So let's say your characters have defeated the wraiths, and instead of going through the rituals again, they try to force open a sophocus. What happens then? You can open this sophocus by using a knock spell, or you can force it open with a strength check. But this is when it gets really dangerous. If you do that, the wall behind will cast Prismatic Spray, and it will affect everyone to the end of this hallway down here. So what you're asking is, what is Prismatic Spray? It's a 7th level spell, and you roll a d8, you get a random effect. So you can get 10d6 fire damage, 10d6 acid damage, 10d6 lightning damage, 10d6 poison damage, 10d6 cold damage, and they're all dexterity saving throws. When you get to Indigo, you get affected by the petrified conditions. If you fail a save, you're restrained. You then make three constitution saving throws. If you succeed three times, you're not restrained anymore. If you fail three times, you're now petrified permanently. So you're eternally, you're permanently turned into stone. And if you've got a number seven, you've got violet. So that means that you're blinded. You have to make a wisdom saving throw or you're teleported to another plane of existence. And because we're inside the tomb, you're going to be teleported to this scary room here full of corpses and you have a 50-50% chance of surviving or dying. So it's super dangerous. And if you're lucky enough to roll at eight, you get hit by two rays instead of one. So it's very, very nasty. So what happens when your characters open Kuzuban's Hofkus? They'll see inside that there's a pair of braces of archery and 20 brittle arrows and a rotting leather quiver. Each arrow shatters on impact and deals only one damage. And if your characters grab the brace of archery, these bracers glow as watery light ripples across the walls. A monstrous tentacled shadow rises from Sophocles, and the air fills with the stench of the swamp. A rumbling voice echoes throughout the tomb. You are brave to summon me. Together we will crush the undying one. What is his flaw and what's his magic item? Kuzuban, the froggy moth, is wild and spirited. While well inhabited by Kuzuban, you gain the following flaw. I am fearless and not afraid to take great risks. While well, Kuzuban inhabits you, your strength score becomes 23 unless it is already higher. So this is massive. So if you've got a fighter or a barbarian and you're using strength, so you're doing grapples, you're doing strength-based attacks, your character has potentially became godlike. You're doing massive increase in damage. However, you become a little bit suicidal. For my personal opinion, I really enjoy Kuzuban. When I ran this game, one of my players took this and he was a cleric and it made a big difference as in instead of him casting spells every turn, he used his mace and he did more damage with his mace than he did with his spells. It also makes it very interesting because you have one character who jumps in fearlessly and it changes the dynamic of the group. For my personal opinion, I think Kuzuban is one of the better tricks your gods. So with Kuzuban, you get bracers of archery. So while wearing these bracers, you have proficiency with the longbow and shortbow, and you gain a plus two to damage rolls and ranged attacks made with such weapons. So this is kind of counterintuitive. Your strengths increase massively, but this won't affect the dexterity based weapons. So it's kind of the opposite of what Kuzuban would do, which I think quite interesting. So ladies and gents, that is me finished for the day. Thank you very much for watching. We have currently went through level three. So we have discussed into the tomb last episode, Kuzuman's Tomb. So in the next episode, we're going to go through Winds of Pandemonium. We're going to go through 38, 39, and finally, we're going to look at 44B, the Polder's Vault. So next episode, we'll finish level three, and then next, we'll descend to level four. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this, 